Good afternoon and welcome to this month's On Track session. I am very excited to have all of you guys here and for Paul Newberger to be joining us. Um, I'm gonna introduce him in a minute, but before I do, I wanna give a shout out to today's sponsors. Huge thank you to TDS and for Upper Iowa University for helping us make this, these programs possible. We absolutely appreciate their support. Um, so please say thank you the next time you see one of their representatives. Um, Zoom. For me, it's been a couple a couple weeks probably since I've done a Zoom. So just a reminder that we would ask you guys to keep yourselves on mute uh, during the presentation to cut out that background noise. And that means you do want that red slash through your microphone, but we would love to see your smiling faces. So please feel free to turn your camera on if you are able. Um, it helps us make sure that we know you guys are out there and not just talking to those black screens. So um, in a second here, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, but I would like to introduce him first. So Paul began his career as a keynote speaker by nearly killing himself, seriously. Then again, there's nothing conventional about Paul, a man who relishes the concept of punching conventional wisdom in the face. His motto is making the impossible possible. Paul first made a name for himself as the cold call coach. Cold calling? You mean the sales practice that everyone dreads? Yes, indeed. Paul actually likes cold calling and has been very successful at it and teaches others how to do it fruitfully. His book, The Secrets to Cold Call Success, is an amazing, is an, it is an amazing uh, Amazon bestseller. And that's actually how I was introduced to Paul several years ago before I was with the chamber. I had the opportunity to bring him in to teach some of our sales reps um, cold calling. And his presentation all these years has stuck with me. So I'm super happy and excited to turn this over to him. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Kristen. Hi, everybody. I'm going to get my uh, PowerPoint presentation up here, and uh, we'll make sure that we are all set and ready to go. But yeah, it is a uh, blessing to be here this afternoon, and I certainly appreciate that warm welcome. And part of the reason that I'm uh, pretty gosh darn excited to be having this conversation with everybody is we're going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart and probably yours as well when we look at the world of sales. One of the things that Kristen was just talking about is my uh, affinity for cold calling. Yes, I'm certifiable. I think my parents dropped me on my head a lot when I was a kid, but I love cold calling. And part of the reason that I love it is two reasons. One, when somebody says something can't be done or is dead, it just makes me want to do it that much more. And number two, I, I'm drawn to things that are hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And I think one of the things that we've done in my organization is we've solved cold calling once and for all. But I would say that's that's half the battle of making a sale, maybe a little bit more than half, because you know, getting that dedicated time is one of the things that a lot of people struggle with. And it's, you know, you hear those two famous words in the world of sales a lot, if only. If only I could get in front of this person, they'd buy right away. If only this person would give me 30 seconds, I know they would see the value in our product or services. And I think the cold calling for the most part is the answer to the if only, but still you're close to the pin. You still got to tap it in. And I, and I, one of the things that I have found is few people in my humble opinion, I mean, no disrespect to anybody on this call here today, but few people run a very good first meeting. I mean, how many times has that happened to you or your organization? Well, wait a minute. I was getting all the right buying signals. Now she's ghosting me. Oh, wait a minute. The guy said all the right stuff. Now he's not returning my phone calls or emails. I mean, it's not you. It's what you're dealing with. And, and one of the things that I believe, too, is, is there is a deep undercurrent with respect to human psychology that's playing against you. Pretty much everything we've been taught about sales meetings, in my humble opinion, is wrong. Because it, it doesn't tap into best practices in human psychology. So one of the things that I did, and again, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm nothing special. This is just me sharing my ideas with you. But not only do me, myself and my clients get in front of a lot of people, thanks to cold calling and outreach and prospecting, but I think we do a nice job of monetizing those opportunities quickly because we do meetings differently. And I call this excellence in business acumen, how to run a world-class initial meeting. And I think this is good, not just generally speaking, but in this age of virtual everything. Gosh, it's hard to run an initial meeting under ideal circumstances in person. It's almost 10 times as hard to do it virtually 
when, yeah, she got the guinea pigs right over there. My kid just so happens to come down in the basement. Uh, there's all these distractions. I'm wearing my pajama pants, so I'm not really into the conversation. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. If you don't connect with them at a deep emotive level quickly, everything that you try to do is going to be for naught. So that's one of the things that I want to talk about here today, creating the framework of a productive initial meeting psychologically so you can connect with this person at a deep emotive level. So I guess this is just a um, the established credibility slide, I guess, for lack of a better term. Successful meetings in action, what you're seeing on the right, these are all the businesses I'm associated with. Yes, I do sleep a couple hours a night anyway, but there's just a lot on this old plate. You know, one of the things about me is I'm a spiritual guy and I believe God can call me home at any minute. So I, I, I do want to lead a high quality life for sure, but there's so many passions that I have. There's so many things that I want to do in life. How the heck do you get it all done? I mean, that's a common question that I have as the owner of five companies, being an international speaker, having just under 50 total employees. Geez, Paul, have you figured out a way to clone yourself? Geez, Paul, do you ever sleep? Is your wife on the precipice of divorcing you? No, but those, I don't blame people for asking those questions because it defies conventional wisdom how you can do it all with that much on your plate. Now, I'm not going to say that this is easy. That's not true. But you really need to focus on quality over quantity when you got so much going on because you rarely have the chance for a do-over. You rarely have extra wiggle room in your calendar. And to spend weeks upon weeks upon weeks chasing somebody after an initial meeting maybe doesn't go according to plan is not conducive to success. So from my perspective, and you know, there's I'm, I'm sure Kristen will will send you my website URL so you can follow up on some of this additional stuff should you so desire. But how do you do it all? Well, one, it just takes very effective time management. Two, it takes a lot of delegation because if you try to put it all on your shoulders, man, that's just no way that's going to work. But then also getting a lot of people to rally behind your ideas. If you're all, that's part of the reason why a laser is, is so powerful and effective. You have all these little molecules, millions of molecules in very close proximity to one another, all going in the same direction. So if you can get your team to do that, if you can get your organization to do that, if you can get your prospects to do that, nothing's going to stand in your way for going forward. But I would also say, you know, adherence to some of the things that you're about to see here over the course of the next 35 minutes or so, it's just a different way to run meetings. And I think what you'll see, now you'll be the judge about whether or not it's a better way, but it, it is a way that's going to put you at an advantage from a human psychology level. And if you can check a lot of boxes, if you can stand out from all of humanity, man, I've never met someone just like her. That's advantage you. If you can connect with somebody at a deep emotive level, because people buy people and people are emotional buyers, not logical buyers. If you can connect at a deep emotive level, and they're all about how you're making them feel. I just feel good when I'm around Kristen. Advantage you. And I would say the other thing, too, is if you can make yourself insanely memorable. You know, they remember parts of your story. They remember things about you. They remember aspects of your conversation. Whereas most financial advisors or most insurance salesmen or most realtors or most whomever could be somewhat forgettable, you're going to be insanely memorable. Gosh, Paul, it sounds like you're uh, huffing markers in a very closed, non-well-ventilated room. No, it is possible if you can do this in a certain way. And I want to give you an example of what this could look like. So I'm going to do a little role play here, and I'm going to have my uh, good friend Kristen Parent join me. Now, because we don't have as much time as we otherwise would for a training like this, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Not so fast that you're like, the heck is going on here, but not so slow where I'm going to go through this in exhaustive detail. So we're going to move through it a little bit faster, but I just want to set the stage here. So Kristen is Kristen. Shocker. She doesn't have to pretend she's somebody that she's not. She's herself. And she works for this wonderful organization called the Middleton Chamber. Now, I, in a previous life, used to be the president of an insurance organization. It's called the Star Group. 
At the time, it was one of the largest independent insurance agencies in the state of Wisconsin, just for argument's sake. And it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, this transcends professions. It transcends careers. So let's just pretend this. Kristen and I are having a conversation. I'm representing the Star Group, and I want to have a conversation with Kristen about their commercial insurance. That's what the purpose of the meeting is. Kristen has agreed to talk to me. I'm in, let's just say, Kristen's office, and the meeting starts. So, Kristen, whenever you're ready, welcome me into your office. Hey, Paul. I'm so glad that you could join, join us in the office today. Looking forward to having a chat. Yeah. Hi, Kristen. It's wonderful to finally meet you. I got to tell you, I've really been looking forward to this conversation, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. So looking forward to this discussion. Awesome. Me too. Well, great. Yeah, I know we got a lot of stuff to talk about, not the least of which is how we can protect your chamber from those what ifs in life. But Kristen, I got to ask, I just based on what I've seen on social media, in particular, LinkedIn, you strike me as a very fascinating person. I got to ask, of all the things that you could be doing, why are you involved with the Middleton Chamber? What is it about this career that you just get so gosh darn passionate about? Wow, Paul. Um, I love connecting people. I love helping business owners grow their business. I love helping people develop their personal skills as well as their business skills. And I think that being the program and events manager for the chamber does all of that because there are so many different businesses that we get to talk to every day. And it's like, how do I help them make themselves just a little bit better? Well, and uh, I can just hear that passion in your voice when you say that. And it's obvious the chamber is very blessed to have you in this capacity. If you don't mind me asking, where does your passion for connecting people come from? I, I just, unless you're one of the few, I can't imagine you were just born that way. I mean, where, where, where does your passion from getting good people connected with each other come from, would you say? I think it's just, it's a personal need to have everyone be at their best. So if I can play a small part of that, I'm, I'm certainly going to try. Yeah. And have you had much experience with small businesses in your background? Because again, it seems like you also want to help business. You want to grow business. You want to allow these people to have a lot of success in that regard. I mean, was there anything in your life that just made you kind of glom on to, to this path in particular? Yeah, there's probably a few. Like my dad was a small business owner uh, growing up. So I saw the blood, sweat and, and tears uh, that went into that building that business. And then I actually also own my own small business. So I feel like that keeps me relatable to the members that we serve because I also go through staffing issues. I also go through, you know, payroll and HR and sales processes and all, all the things. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking real quick, what did your father do? What kind of a small business did he run? He ran a construction company with his brother. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a skill set God did not bless me with, needless to say, just building <laughs> stuff and putting stuff together. But nope, yeah, I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I would call mine too, but my, my dad is no better than I am, needless to say. <laughs> But no, I, I really respect that about your dad. My, my father for 15 years worked two jobs just so he could put my brother and I through private high school. So it was, it was kind of like being a small business owner in that regard. So I can certainly relate to that. I mean, one of the things, Kristen, that, that I, I feel, even though we're different people from different backgrounds, one of the synergies that we have is for us, these aren't so much careers or jobs. They're more vocations. And I didn't set out to be the president of the star group. It, it kind of found me. And, and long story short, I was a sales consultant for quite a while. Thankfully, we had a lot of business, but two things started to happen. One, I was having some problems at home. I don't mind telling you, just when you're away a lot, that can put some strain on your marriage, which my wife and I endured a little bit. But then I was also a bit of an absentee dad. I was just starting to ask myself, what am I doing all this for, if not for my family? But then I started to develop some weird health issues, and it culminated in October of 2017, when I blacked out passing, uh, when, I, when I passed out giving a, a speech, I just wasn't taking good care of myself. And my doctor said, you're killing yourself. Well, the problem, because what do I do? I mean, I'm the business. I, I, you know, people are paying me. And it was right around that time that the Star Group reached out. I was their, their sales trainer for a couple of years, and they offered me the presidency. It was a total God thing as far as I was concerned. And 
the two things that really stood out, one, I, I was hurting in the family side and my health wasn't very good. Well, that's what the Star Group is. One, it's a family-owned agency that treats all their clients like family. And two, every year, the Star Group is one of the healthiest organizations on the planet, uh, just based on the way that we take care of ourselves and our employees. So what I needed the most was family and health. And what I got at the Star Group was family and health. So just like it seems you're, you're called to do what you do, I feel the same here. And I appreciate you uh, sharing your story with me a little bit. Absolutely. Real quick, because I know we got some stuff to get through, but I was just dying to ask you, I saw on LinkedIn that you are a volunteer at Reach a Child. How did you get involved with that organization? Uh, yeah, I threw, actually, it was through my employer. Uh, we were a sponsor, but I just really felt drawn to their mission. So I, I found and wanted to provide time to them. And, and what is it about their mission that drew you so much? Children. Probably um, because I have children and the small business that I run is geared towards families with kids. Um, and so they're, they're just there to help first responders during traumatic situations. So uh, with the, with the power of a book, I've learned a lot. Oh, well, I give you a lot of credit for that. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, those situations where the cops have to be on a scene or where there's an emergency that can be absolutely devastating for a child. And the fact that you're supporting a cause that makes life a little bit easier. I, I commend you. That's uh, that's really exciting. Well, I tell you what, Kristen, boy, you and I could probably continue this conversation forever. You're a great conversationalist. I think we have a lot in common. And in fact, I think we should probably schedule maybe a separate follow-up. I've got some additional questions about your nonprofit, but I certainly want to be a good steward of your time. So what do you say we get down to brass tacks and talk a little insurance? Let's do it. How about a round of applause for Kristen Parent, everybody? <laughs> fantastic and pizza taco man is raising the roof on you that is pretty outstanding <laughs> all right so the heck were you just listening to wait a minute paul you didn't talk about insurance i know so high level overview like i said we're going to go through this pretty quick but if you <laughs> excuse me i'm getting over a cold if you want some additional information i'll make sure that Kristen sends you my email address my website and everything else but one of the things that i believe is i believe every first meeting needs to be dissected into two chunks, the pre-meeting and the meeting. The pre-meeting is what you just saw. The pre-meeting is everything that takes place from the minute you start having the conversation to when you transition to the sales piece, what you do best. I'm not going to talk at all about the meeting because I'm going to assume you know how to sell your products and services. If not, obviously, it would be a blessing to serve you in some capacity. But I believe a couple of things, as I said in the opening, one, people buy people first, two, people are emotional buyers, three, it's all about differentiation, and four, can you really connect with somebody at a deep level? Until all those things take place, your meeting will never be as effective as it otherwise should be. Now, you have to have a certain degree of emotional intelligence, and all I mean by that is you need to be able to read a person and you need to be able to read a situation. So I've had some conversations where it's an hour long meeting and my pre-meeting was 45 minutes. And part of the reason it's so, well, geez, Paul, why, when are you gonna talk about insurance? Well, I'll tell you, because the bigger the opportunity, the more I really wanna crush the pre-meeting. Because if, if this thing is gonna pay me a lot of money, if my services and products are a perfect fit for this person, I don't wanna leave anything to chance. And if we're really hitting it off on a deep level, why not run with it a little bit? Because you only got one chance to make a very favorable first impression. Now, if we're there to talk about insurance, at some point, you got to do that. If the pre-meeting isn't going very well, if it's a small opportunity, if the quality of the dialogue isn't very good, okay, well, then maybe you can get through it a little bit quicker. But most people sit down and say something like, Kristen, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. So why'd you take this insurance meeting today? What is it about insurance that you're curious about? Well, how can I help you from an insurance? No. I mean, why don't we hold hands before we kiss? I mean, I haven't sold myself yet. I haven't gotten to know her at a deep emotive level yet. I haven't bonded with her yet. Now I'm going to insurance, people by people first. So what we just modeled, Kristen and I, I came up with five parts to an effective initial meeting. Here they are. And we'll go through this. What we're going to spend the rest of our time doing is we're going to be going through this piece by piece until uh, my time is up. One, I, I did what's called the disarming greeting. I greeted Kristen in a way that is designed to disarm her, knock her back on her heels a little bit, pleasantly surprise her, exceed her expectations, 
I mean, if I were to tell you, hey, you're about to sit through an insurance meeting, I have a good idea of what your mental thought process would be like right now. And it's really a great insurance meeting. I want to greet her in a way that gets her to go, maybe this is going to be a different type of meeting. We'll talk about that. Number two, as you may have noticed, I went to the ask the why. Now I've got a full training on this. It's called why development training. So we're going to hit the high levels here today, but somebody's why is basically their secret sauce. And you hear this a lot. Simon Sinek made this really popular several years ago about his teachings with respect to why. Your why is your story. Your why is your differentiator. Your why separates you from all of humanity. And if you can tell it in a powerful way, it also hits people at an emotive level. With all that being said, doesn't it make sense to try to know a prospect's secret sauce as quickly as possible? I would say most assuredly, and you can kind of hear it again. I, I told Kristen we were going to do a role play. I didn't tell her what we were going to be talking about as God is my witness. So one of the things, if you go back and listen to the recording, Kristen had said kind of like, well, gosh, Paul, when I asked that question, because they're not prepared for that. I, I didn't think I'd be answering that, but she dove right in. After that, we then proceed to personal reciprocity. Personal, meaning I'm going to tell her my personal story and reciprocity, I'm going to reciprocate. Kristen told me something powerful, something personal, and I'm going to reciprocate by doing the same. And there's a number of different things that are pluses for doing that. And that was when I told her my personal story about becoming the president of the star group. When that's done, and again, I went through this fairly quickly just for training purposes. But when that was done, you'll notice that I asked her some questions about reach a child. That's what we call rapport building. The whys are good to establish emotional comfort. The whys are good to connect at a deep level, but now I need to start gaining some intel above and beyond that, hence the rapport building. And then lastly, again, as much as it's wonderful to connect with Kristen, to get to know her, to forge this deep emotional bond, that don't pay the bills as good as it is. So now what we gotta do is I wanna validate her and the conversation that we had, and then I wanna transition into the purpose of this meeting, which was the insurance piece. So what you saw as we acted that out are all five parts seamlessly strewn together. So what I want to do is I want to walk through each of these parts, tell you a little bit about why I do it, why it taps into somebody at a deep emotive level, why it helps from a psychological perspective. And then Kristen is going to be my uh, trusty question screener. So if there are any questions, let her know. Otherwise, you know, feel free to save them to the end, but most people don't want to hear me drone on and on and on and on and on. So we'll break it up a little bit. So what I'm not going to do from a time perspective, otherwise I would definitely do this, is these are the three questions that I ask in all of these workshops that I do. I'll put them up here this one time, and maybe when I go through them, I'll put them up to remind you. But I would just ask yourself these questions. Maybe you didn't even notice what was going on. So maybe it's kind of hard to answer that, but now kind of in retrospect, now that I'm telling you, well, this is what I did. And this is a little bit about why I did that. I would just challenge you to ask yourself these questions. Question one, how did you feel when I did that? I mean, Kristen kind of came on, Paul, hey, welcome. Thanks for being here. And I can, Kristen, hi, how are you? Boy, I've been looking forward to this. You know, that disarming greeting, did you feel, <coughs> did you feel a certain way when I did that, question number two, how is that similar or dissimilar to your current style? Do you greet people in a similar fashion or not? Do you try to exceed their expectation from the get-go or not? It's interesting. I work with a very large financial services organization. I work with several of their advisors, and it just so happened yesterday we were talking about this, and one of the guys says, man, that goes against every training I've ever been taught. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we've been taught to be cool calm, collected, reserved, confident, like a quiet confidence. Kristen, hello. Thank you for being here. I look forward to talking to you about this. I thought people won't remember what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel when you said it. Your job is to give them an emotional experience every interaction that you have with somebody. And having a quiet, calm, con you don't got to be a, a raving maniac bouncing off the walls. But having a quiet confidence that's very subdued, I don't think gives them an emotional feeling. So how similar or dissimilar is that to what you do? And then lastly, what aspects of what I did, if any, could you implement on your end? These are the standard three questions that I'm going to put on the screen 
for each part. We don't have time to go through it necessarily, but I would just say, ask yourself those questions. Now that I'm forcing you to, now that I'm asking you to go back, now that I'm asking you to really get granular with this process. Speaking of which, let's talk about that disarming greeting a little bit more. Paul, it's so quick. Paul, it's just a greeting. Paul, I'm just saying hello. Get a life. Did you know that the human attention span is 4.2 seconds? Did you know that the attention span of a goldfish is 6.3? Humans have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. So if you don't get off to a hot start, if you don't make a favorable first impression right away, now you face an uphill battle. Not only that, I don't want to add pressure to you, but you only have one chance to make a favorable first impression. Your greeting is usually that chance. If you don't take your greeting seriously, why should your prospect take you seriously? I really mean that. So a couple of quick things on the disarming greeting. It sets the stage. It's all about foreshadowing. An insurance meeting sounds about as fun as a freaking root canal. Mm, yeah, probably if done the traditional way, but here comes an energetic, passionate person who says, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Very excited to talk to you. Really? Uh, who, who's ever very excited about anything when it comes to insurance? As I said, you only have a couple of seconds to make a favorable first impression. Why waste it? Why? Well, I'm told I have to have quiet confidence. Well, while you have your quiet confidence, I'm going to sit there in, in quiet because I'm confident this was a bad decision. If you're not excited, why should I be? If you weren't looking forward to talking to me, why should I be? If you can't get passionate, why should I be? People are emotional buyers. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you wake up out of bed every morning feeling like a million bucks? How many of you feel blessed beyond measure every single day? How many of you just, you feel like you got this world licked and everything is peaches and rainbows and gumdrops? I sure as heck don't. This world has a great job of beating the crap out of us, beating the snot out of us. We have stresses. Maybe we're hurting financially. Maybe we're hurting relationally. Maybe we're hurting spiritually. Maybe we take two seconds on social media and we say, everybody's having a good life but me. If for five seconds I can make you feel like you're the center of the universe, wouldn't you find that a value? Why do you go to Paul? Is he the smartest guy in the world? No. Is he the kindest guy in the world? No. Why do you go to Paul? Because I like how I feel when I'm around Paul. Could you imagine if all of your clients said the same thing? And a disarming greeting is a certain way to do that. Plus, that it can increase the intimacy of your connection. I'm looking you directly in the eye. Maybe I have my hand on your shoulder when I'm shaking your hand. Maybe I'm cupping both of your hands in mine. Maybe just the tone of my voice and the cadence makes you feel there's no place in the world I'd rather be than with you right here, right now. It increases the intimacy and the emotional impact of that initial conversation. So again, I know we're successful people. I know we're people that are used to running meetings, but you really got to pay attention to your gathering or to your greeting. And I'm, I'm shocked at how very few people do. Let's get through one more. And then if there's any questions, I'll pause. And my trusted associate, Kristen Parent, is going to uh, let me know if there's any questions. One of the things that you'll notice, now the greeting, what, what's spectacular about the greeting? Nothing. Everybody greets somebody at the start of the meeting. Now, it's not so much the what, it's the how, and a little bit about the why behind it. But what you may have noticed that was pretty different pretty quick is after Kristen welcomed me in, after we exchanged that pleasant, the pleasant greetings, after I kind of set the stage emotionally, what did I do? I went right into the why. The heck does that have to do about anything? We're here to talk about insurance. We're here to talk about the Middleton Chamber. I'm here to sell myself to some degree. What am I doing? Asking Kristen about her why. Have you ever been asked that within 10 seconds of sitting down with somebody, especially somebody who's trying to sell to you? Hey, Kristen. Hey, so-and-so. Hey, taco pizza man. Why do you do what you do? Nobody asked that. And that's why most initial meetings aren't as productive as they could have been. Again, the same questions. Feel free to answer these questions in your head. How did you feel when I did that? I have to imagine you noticed that. That's a little weird. Do you do anything similar or dissimilar to that? And now that you've kind of experienced it and heard Kristen kind of give her response, what aspects, if any, could you implement on your side? So let's start unpacking that a little bit. Why ask the why? 
especially so early in the conversation. I've got a couple of thoughts about that. One, people love to talk about themselves. And you'll hear, this is nothing new. You'll hear this from other trainers. You'll hear this in other training formats as well. Just get that person talking. I just think they go about it in kind of the wrong way. How about them Packers? Fine. You know, people aren't stupid. I know what you're trying to do. Oh, that's a nice bass you have on your wall there. You fish, eh? Yeah. I know, I know what you're trying to do here. I mean, you don't, don't, don't try to necessarily find common ground right away because I don't know if I like you yet. And that's one of the things that I think people are trying to ascertain. Is this person trustworthy? Do I like this person? I'm not just going to start talking about sea bass and whatever else right off the bat. So, or you'll have somebody talk about, well, why'd you take this meeting today? Because I need insurance. Move on. One of the things that I really find that works is getting them, if you get somebody to talk about something that they're passionate about, you know, you find bass packers, whatever. But people are usually where they are for a reason. And there's usually a pretty powerful story behind it that people are very excited to start talking about. Plus, as they start talking about that story, what starts to happen as they start reminiscing, as they start going down memory lane, as they start throwing out various hints and clues and everything else, they start winding themselves up. And if you were listening to anything that Kristen said, you could hear the passion in her voice. You could hear the anecdotes that she was giving. You could hear the people that she was talking about that led her here to this time and place. And the number one thing that I believe, two things, I suppose, that have to happen before you get to the meeting, one, the walls have to come down. How am I going to get you to talk about insurance if those walls are still up? How am I going to get you to talk about financial advising if those walls are going to come up? The only way you get those walls to come down is to get people to talk, to get them to feel comfortable, and to get them to go, this is great. There's, I love this guy. There's no place else I'd rather be, which leads to number two. You got to get them to like you a little bit. And this is kind of oxymoronic, I suppose, but I've been in meetings where I've asked this question, they've given me a 30 minute response. I've just been doing this. And they say, Paul, you're a great conversationalist. I haven't said anything. It's again, it's how you make them feel. I, it's like a lawnmower. I got to pull the chain a couple of times, but it's up and running. And I get the credit because I got them going down that path. People love to talk about themselves and asking about their why is a very good way to start to have them do that. Number two, you gain incredible insight on this person. Did you hear all the stuff that Kristen said? Talking about her passions, talking about her father, talking about being a connector, talk about small business. Are you gaining insight from her just based on all these things that she's talking about? Boy, sure as heck beats the Packers. What do you think of the Packers? Yeah, Aaron Rodgers and the nickel defense. And boy, why didn't they get Devontae Adams at the GM as a, you know, dunce or whatever. Yeah, fine. We're, 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 we have similar commonalities, but I'm learning about her father. I'm learning about the sacrifice her father made. I'm learning about the things that drive Kristen as a person. Y you, you think that's going to be helpful for me when I try to find a way to sell to her? I know what she cares about. I know what her passions are. Plus, if she tells me how she ended up here, might I know a little bit about her decision-making process, how she makes decisions, how she weighs opportunities, how she looks at things holistically? Yeah, this is a precursor to a deep relational connection. What was one of the things that I did before I told her a little bit about my why at the Star Group? I talked about my father, which is all true, by the way. You know, my dad, my, my family was lower middle class. We never heard it for anything. We never wanted for anything, but we couldn't afford a Catholic private high school. No way. So my dad took a second job as a paper boy, a paper. He's in the mid forties working as a paper boy every weekend to scrape enough money together to send my brother and I to a private school. Now that's not a business per se, but Kristen knows what it's like to have a father sacrifice me too. You think that's starting to separate me from other insurance agents? Yeah. The other thing that I like about this too is Kristen starts going through her why at a deep psychological level. It's a validation of her life choices. Not all, and I'm not, there's a difference between arrogance and ego. Ego is healthy, you know, to some degree. You know, I'm, I deserve to be here. I deserve success. I deserve to be sitting down from a big wig like Kristen Parent. You know, arrogance is, 
you know, I'm the best thing in the world. I don't need to prepare. But a lot of us struggle with doubt. Me especially. I, I, I struggle with doubt a lot. And there's times where you're, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I talking to the right person? Am I making the right decisions? And when I ask you to tell me your why, this is why I do it. These are all the things that happened in my life. You're validating those life choices that you made, which is making you start to go, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the right things. I'm saying the right things. Look at where it led me. At the end of the day, as she talks about her father, again, based on the way that she talked about it, is that going to stir up good emotions or bad emotions? Good. As she's talking about connecting small business, good emotions or bad emotions? Good. As she starts talking about her passions for reach a child and her children and what she does professionally, good emotions or bad emotions? You see what I'm doing here? People are emotional buyers, and this is becoming a feel-good factory because she's telling me her story, and she's revisiting a lot of these things that are important to her. I never would have gotten this if I didn't start off by asking the why. I'll pause here. Kristen, do we have any questions, or does anybody else want to ask me anything before I continue on? I don't see any questions right now, but I think one of the notes that I wrote down, Paul, from when you were talking was... Um, about just that, that emotion and thinking about like the last business that I left or company that I no longer partner with. It's, I left, it's because of how they made me feel, right? So I think that's reinforced is what you're saying is that people buy emotion and how, how you make them feel. I would agree. I mean, again, at the end of the day, and this is just my opinion, and if anybody wants to disagree, I'm not going to love you any less, but you talk about differentiation. How many insurance organizations are there? A ton. How many insurance salespeople are there? A ton. But my only question now, and Kristen is kind of validating that, but when we're done, if we turned it around to Kristen and said, Kristen, how did you feel at the end of that meeting? I guarantee you she's never been a part of an insurance meeting like that. And we're finding all these commonalities. You're passionate about small business? Me too. You volunteer for children causes? Me too. You have a father that sacrificed a lot for your betterment? Me too. You're a person of faith? Me too. Look at all these things that come up that never would have come up if you started off by saying, hey, Kristen, why'd you take this insurance meeting today? It's just, it's just a smarter way of doing it. If we go to part three, this is personal reciprocity. So this is where I told my why. Same, same questions. Now that we're looking back on this retrospectively, now that we're looking at this through a discerning lens, how did you feel when I gave my why? about joining the star group. How is that similar or dissimilar to your current style? And what aspects of that, if any, could you implement on your end? Here's Kristen telling me about her why, and I took that and I reciprocated. Why? Why? Does it sound like a sales pitch now that I'm talking about this? Paul, why, why aren't you letting her go? What, what, why are you talking in this manner now? There's a couple of reasons why I think personal reciprocity is so good. Number one, it makes myself vulnerable. This is another reason why I don't really like that quiet confidence kind of a thing is there's nothing wrong with it per se, but look, we're all broken. We're all busted. We're all sinful. We're all stressed. We are. Every one of you to some degree on this call has something on your mind that's not pleasant. You wouldn't be human if that wasn't possible. And what I get sick of are mutton heads like me that come on here that go, well, I'm the best in the world. Come on. Life is happy. All you got to do is try harder. B.S. BS. We're all going through stuff. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to work with somebody who acts like they have their life together. I don't want to act or I don't want to work with Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. I want to work with somebody who has had struggles in their life or somebody who at least can relate to mine. And that's what I did with my story. Because part of the reason I wanted to make myself vulnerable is what did Kristen make herself vulnerable? Now, I've seen this where some people tell you a story. Now, again, Kristen knows that we're training, so she's a professional, so she's going through it, maybe not get going as expansive as she otherwise could have. But I've seen it where people just go deep. I mean, deep. You don't know where you're going to connect these people, and you're giving them a license to open up to you. Some take advantage of that. You know, they, they talk about their marriage, kind of like I did. They'll, they'll talk about health issues, kind of like I did. They'll talk about things that, what am I telling a stranger this for? And you can kind of sort of sense, oh, boy. Why did I tell her all that? Why did I tell him all that? Can I trust this person with that? Oh my gosh, I don't even tell someone, you caught me on a bad day. I don't even tell my friends that. The reason I wanna reciprocate personally is you trusted me with something, now I'm gonna trust you. 
I have something on you. I'm going to give you something on me. It's, it's, a, it's an unspoken way to build trust with somebody. Kristen didn't ask me to tell my why. I proactively offered it to her because I think it's important that she has it. She knows now my marriage was on the rocks. She knows now that I was an absentee father. She knew now that I had some health problems because she opened up to me. I want her to have that because what's going to happen when I reciprocate, Kristen's going to say, wow, Paul accepted that. Paul took it in and Paul gave me something. Maybe I can trust him. And if you can trust somebody, what does that do? That accelerates them opening up. You like that one. How about this? Well, it's funny you mentioned that about your dad. Let me tell you about my mom. Well, you heard that about my mom. Let me tell you this about my childhood. Because I can trust him. Because we have these things in common. Because the more I'm giving of myself, the more Paul has given me back. Well, again, don't you want to accelerate opening and build trust before we get into the meeting? Gosh, I used to be a financial advisor in a previous life. And this is, this is part of where I started to develop this. I felt so incredibly self-conscious. Hi, Kristen. How are you? Yeah, thanks for coming in today. So let's talk finances. What's your credit score? Hey, how much money do you have? What are some of the things that keep you up at night? Blah, 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 blah. Man, that's deeply personal, dude. We just met. We just met. I want to get you, tr I want to, what I found is I would give stuff on myself just so that they could have something on me to say, geez, Paul trusted me with that. Maybe I can trust him with my credit score or whatever the case may be, because people buy people first, not companies. And this is a tragic mistake that a lot of salespeople make. Now, when you're buying an entity, you buy both, you buy people and the company. I mean, I love Kristen. She's fantastic. But if the Middleton chamber was involved in a bunch of scandals, sorry, Kristen can't do it. Or vice versa, the Middleton Chamber, I love it. Kristen, can't stand her, said nobody ever. But at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're buying both. But they buy people first. Once they know you, like you, trust you, they're more likely to do business with you. If they heard my why, if Kristen knows now, you know, I'm not just doing this because I'm paid. I'm not just doing this because it's a job. I could get a job anywhere. I'm doing this for a deep reason. Well, isn't that somebody who you want to do business with? Storytelling is the most powerful way to get somebody to buy you at a deep emotive level. If you're not telling stories in every interaction, boy, how do you, you missing out? And it doesn't have to be like a Jurassic Park two hour movie. I mean, you can tell a story in two sentences. It can be, you know, like that famous elevator pitch. We, we get on the elevator at the seventh floor. We have about 25 seconds before we get the ground floor. How can I tell you about myself and my business in those 25 seconds? I mean, your story is really your life. It's really your vocation. And whether you have the time that I had or whether you're cold calling, your ability to, to start throwing out hints about your story are really going to separate you <coughs> at the end of the day because you're the only person on earth that has your story. Lastly, it shows your job as your vocation. I actually used that word when I was talking to Kristen is when I asked Kristen's why and she was explaining why she's at the Middleton Chamber. Yeah, I mean, we could relate a little bit. But we're different people from different backgrounds with different philosophies, with different skill sets. We have similarities, but we also have differences. The thing that brought us together is Kristen is called to do this. And a lot of you are, your, are her friends. A lot of you know her. And I think a lot of you would agree. She was born for this role. Would you agree? So I want to work with somebody who feels called to do what they're doing. And when I tell you my why, my family was falling apart. My health was falling apart. And now that I work for an organization that values both and I get to extend that to my clients, don't you want to work with somebody who feels called to do this? Your why enables that to happen. Let me get through one more and then I'll check again to see if there's any additional questions. So now after I give my why, and again, this was that part of the story that after I told about the star group, I thanked, I went back to Kristen and I thanked her. I said, well, you know, I just wanted you to know a little bit about my why and I thank you for sharing yours with me. And Kristen, you know, you're welcome. Well, I wanted to do one more thing and I wanted to do rapport building. And the reason I want to do rapport building, now this can be quick. This doesn't have to be long, but the reason I wanted to do rapport building, I gained a lot of good intelligence about Kristen in her why story. A lot of good stuff, probably stuff that you wouldn't normally get in a traditional run of the mill meeting. But now that I know her story and I know some of the information that led to this, let's see if I can find some additional commonalities. Let's see if I can find some other things that make her tick, likes, interests, passions, things that she cares about. Because the more synergistic we are, 
the more things we have in common, the more mutual shared experiences we have, it stands to reason the more Kristen's going to like me and the more Kristen likes me, the more she's going to want to do business with me. So again, the same thing. And I started off by asking about reach a child. So when I asked those couple of questions, how did you feel when I did that? How is that similar or dissimilar to what you do? And what aspects, if any, could you start to implement on your side? Why do I do that rapport building? Well, Paul, didn't the why give you enough? Not really. It's a, it's a definite start in the right direction. But again, one of the things that you'll notice is I started that section off by, hey, I know we got some insurance stuff to talk about, but boy, I, I've been dying to ask you. Now, do you have to say those exact words? No. But I, I want to make Kristen feel special. That's that word again, feel. I've been dying to ask you. It's not like an off the cuff question. I thought about this in advance. It was important to me. And I've really been looking forward to asking you this question for a while. You have? Is that not flattering to some degree? Even if it's a simple question. Kristen, before we get into insurance, I got it. I mean, I've been dying to ask you something. It's flattering. I'm making her feel a certain way. It shows that I'm interested in what she has to say. I already mentioned the flattery piece. One of the things that this does too is some meetings go sideways quickly because you lose control. They take over the agenda. There is no agenda. People start going all over the place. I'm in control here. Hold on. We're going to get to insurance, but I want to steer it in this direction here really quick. And again, it allows me to get some world-class intelligence. Why do you think there are so many intelligence agencies in the federal government? Intelligence is gold, be it the CIA, the FBI, the NSA. You look at what Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram, you know, what do they do with all the intelligence that they gain on people? The intelligence is gold. The more I can learn, the better. So I ask a question that you really want intelligence to. Is there a question that can help you make the sale? Is there a question that you think you're going to have synergies on so you can connect at that deep emotive level? I only go into the, the conversation with one scripted play, and then I follow what's called the sale method. My scripted play was what I said about Reach a Child. I looked up Kristen on LinkedIn. Again, she's a friend of mine, so I know who she is, but I wanted to find one thing to glom onto, and I asked about Reach a Child. That's going to be my scripted play because I have children because I serve on boards, because I volunteer, because I'm charitably inclined, and I figured we might have some commonalities there. But what I, what I mean by the sale method is if you really want to listen, you need to hang on everybody's word. And where people start to go south is they've got this list full of questions. These are the 15 questions I want to get through. What happens if the prospect goes in this area? It's going to look like you're not listening pretty quick if they're going here and you go mm, about that. Okay, let's talk about group benefits. Wait, what? Are you even listening to me? Are you paying attention? Plus, if they want to talk about it, that means that's important to them. Let's get them going. So I call this the sail method. It's like a sailboat. A sailboat doesn't move on itself. A sailboat moves because of the wind power. All the sail does is it harnesses the wind power and it moves in the direction that the wind blows. That's exactly what we're doing here. The wind, in this case, are the words that come out of somebody's mouth. Let's catch it and go with it. And the way that I like to kind of demonstrate that is catch it, go deep. Catch it, go deep. Catch it, go deep. And the reason I don't want any other scripted plays is I, it's sink or swim, baby. I want you to focus on their every word. If you miss what they say next, you're screwed. Focus on it. Go all in with this. So if I said, so my scripted play. So I, I saw on LinkedIn that you volunteer to reach a child. That looks like a great organization. How'd you get involved? Whatever she says next, I'm going with. I have no backup. I have no ripcord. I'm jumping out of the, uh, the airplane with the parachute. If it doesn't open, that's it. So Kristen says, well, I'm very passionate about kids. I have kids of my own, et cetera. Oh, you have, oh so I could grab onto it. Oh, you have kids of your own. How old are they and what are their names? Grab it, go deep. Oh, I've got four kids, whatever. Grab it, go deep. Grab it, go deep. And pretty soon what's going to start happening is this person's going to realize, man, you're, you're hanging on my every word. You're showing a vested interest in this kind of thing. You're, you're getting to see where these commonalities are. And the, the rule that I have here is a minimum of three volleys. Once is a coincidence. I'm sorry. Once, once is a random occurrence, an anomaly. Once is an anomaly. Twice is a coincidence. Thrice is a pattern. If you can do something in a lab, a scientific experiment three times, the burden of proof is on your side and science is going to agree with you. So if I ask one question and I get a uh-huh response, it's an anomaly. Maybe I just asked the wrong question. I ask a second question, I get a uh-huh response. Maybe that's just a coincidence. I'm over two. I ask a third question, I get a uh-huh response. It's a pattern. This person's not interested in talking. Let's move on. So I, I do try to get three volleys, but I do want to be mindful of the overall duration. This is where that emotional intelligence 
plays a role. Ultimately, we got to talk about insurance. Eventually, we got to talk about what we do professionally. That's the way we position this meeting after all. But if you can find ways to get common ground, if you can find ways to build rapport, if you can find ways to get them to gain, to, to disseminate some of that intelligence, it's going to be advantage you. And the best rapport building scenarios I can think of are the ones where you're talking as little as possible. Maybe just get that lawnmower running. There goes Kristen. She stops. Grab it. Oh, that's interesting about the kids. Go deep. Let her talk. So hopefully by this point, I'll pause. Kristen, I'll send it back to you to see if there's any questions. But by this point, I've, I've greeted her in a very disarming manner. I've gotten to know her why. I've told her my why. We've built a little bit of rapport and found common ground. I got one more piece to talk about, and then we're done. Kristen, any, uh, any questions at all on your side? Yeah, we do have a question. So why are the traditional trainings focused the way they are on the content or whatever you're promoting rather than on the relationship? We know we like to do business with people we like and trust. So why hasn't that always been the focus? It's a good question. Um, I mean, the way that I just see a lot of meetings being run, and I don't know why people train the way that they do, but I, I think if we're all honest with ourselves is ghosting a problem. Yeah. It, how many times have we left a meeting going, this went fantastic, this went great. I can't wait to make this person a client. And then it never comes to fruition. The, the only thing that I can think of is the, the, the traditional, there is some overlap between what I'm saying and what other people teach. I just think we, we push it in different directions. So if I was a financial advisor, you know, I'm told to show up. I'm told to make small talk, like rapport building here. For me, it's the fourth in the process. For them, they lead with it. I just don't think people are warmed up enough to have a deep level of small talk with you. We, we, we need to get them a little bit warmer. You're going to have a lot of superficial stuff. I know he likes the Packers, blue cars, and soda. Good luck with that. Well, what is that going to do? I, I, I know that Kristen is passionate about connecting people because she had a father that sacrificed a lot for her family, and she feels it's her calling in life to help small business owners make their life a little easier. I got you trumped. So again, they're trying to have you do something similar. I just think we go a little bit deeper rather than just finding commonality. No, no, I want to I learn about your story. Tell me your story. Or other people will do it the other way. Now that we're meeting, hey, before we get going, let me tell you my story. Well, wait a minute. Why am I hearing your story first? We should hear their story because the more they talk, the more warmed up they're going to be. They're going to be more receptive to hearing my story once I've listened to them tell theirs. It's like the whole law of givers gain. Some people, you know, I don't want to get too, I don't want to wax too poetic here, but some people live, live a lonely existence. When you're married with kids, how lonely can you be? If you're married with kids, you know exactly how lonely that can get sometimes. You and your spouse are like two ships that don't see each other. Maybe your kids are really busy with their stuff or they're home, but they're on their iPad. How was your dinner tonight? Fine. Or how was your day today? Fine. You feel like you're all alone in life sometimes. You could be right in the middle of all this activity, but you feel like nobody sees you. Nobody recognizes you. Here's somebody in my insurance meeting going, tell me your story, friend. I'd love to hear it. That's a blessing to people sometimes. So I'm not here to knock any training at all. I don't elevate myself by tearing others down. I just think this is a better way to do it. I see what the other trainings are trying to do. Ours just is a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more direct. And I think when you can get people to talk about themselves, open up, get the juices flowing that quickly, I just think it's going to be conducive to a very effective meeting. Great question. I hope I answered it okay. Let me, uh, let me end on this, and then we'll, uh, we'll see if there's any questions, because it looks like we're doing right about where we're supposed to be. So on part five, validation and transition, because <coughs> my baby girl, she's four. She loves her father so much she gave me a cold. Thanks, Reagan. Um, let's talk about the validation first. So this is, okay, how do we go from the pre-meeting to the meeting? Again, the same thing. How did that make you feel? How is it similar or dissimilar to what you do? And then what aspects of this could you implement? Let's get a little granular with this piece. So I said a couple of things and I just want, again, I don't do everything right, but I do everything with a purpose. I don't usually say things accidentally. I might not say the right thing. Ask my wife, she'll tell you, but everything that I say had some forethought in it, good or bad. So one of the things that I told Kristen is I said, I could talk with you all day. Why did I tell her that? I told her that because I wanted to compliment her. Some people get to this point and they've done all the talking. 
They're talking about their story. They're talking about the rapport building. They're talking about their families. They're talking about everything but insurance. Some of these people feel self-conscious. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. You came here to talk about insurance. I'm talking your ear off. Oh, you must hate me. Actually, it's on the contrary. There's no place I'd rather be. Oh, I, I could just listen to you all day. You're such a fascinating person with a great story. So it complements them. It puts them at ease. Again, that's a feeling that you want to start to give. Plus, it empowers them at a deep emotive level. Man, I just told this guy some of these things. Should I have done that? I could talk with you all day. Thank you for trusting me with this. Man, you're a special person, and you're really doing a lot of good in life. Hey, you know, that's all back to that feeling thing. And what you'll also notice is I, I snuck this in there. Well, I could talk with you all day, Kristen. I know we're kind of limited on time, but I would love to find some time maybe over pizza or tacos or something and just to continue this discussion between the two of us. Oftentimes, especially if you've hit it off over those first 20 or 30 minutes, somebody's going to say, I'd love that. I haven't even gotten into insurance yet, and I just booked appointment number two. And I would say that that is more powerful on a personal level because this person likes me. We haven't talked about anything professional yet, and they want to see me again. We haven't talked about how I can help their organization and they want to have beers with me because I'm making them feel a certain way. They're entering into a series of agreements before we've even talked about insurance. Now, does that mean that they're going to give me their insurance business? Of course not. I still have to be competent. I still have to have a good price. I still got to take care of their stuff. But your odds of success go way up if they like you. How many people want to have beer with their insurance agent? How many people even know who their insurance agent is? advantage me because I set the stage to these series of agreements. I then transitioned to say, hey, I want to be a good steward of your time. Now, if my team was listening, they'd be rolling their eyes because that's, I mean it when I say it, but that's kind of like my go-to phrase. I want to be a good steward of your time. I value your most precious commodity. Your most precious commodity is time. And I want to be a good steward of it. And then I ended by saying, let's get down to brass tacks. Again, that's just a Paulism, I suppose. It, it ensures that we don't lose focus. It ensures that we're really going to talk about the things that we said we're going to talk about. And it's informal and non-threatening. Brass tax. I mean, people haven't said that since the Harry Truman administration. So it shows I don't take myself too seriously. It's very informal. And I'm not saying, let me see those insurance deck pages. No, I'm just saying, hey, let's, let's get down to brass tax. I'm steering the ship. And I'm moving this toward a successful conclusion. So speaking of which, as we get ready to conclude, and I've got a little bit of time to stay on and ask, answer any questions that you might have. I, uh, as Kristen so generously pointed out in her very flattering opening, uh, I do have a book. It's called The Secrets of Cold Call Success. If you send me an email, just so I have your email address, I'm going to randomly pick three winners. It's entirely up to you. If you want to do it, no pressure. I'm not going to love you any less if you don't want to. But if you'd like a complimentary copy of the book, send me an email and I'm going to draw three winners by the close of business day tomorrow, just to give you a little bit of extra time in case you get busy and you forget to do that. But in the meantime, it's been a blessing to talk to you. This is one of my most favorite topics to discuss. I think if we can work smarter, not harder, and we can do things in a different order, it can literally transform your business for the good. Again, I'm Paul M. Newberger. That's my email address, not my email. That's my website and my cell phone. And if I can be of any further service, I'm never too busy to talk to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, amazing. As I think back to, you know, when we met, I, I think it was when Reagan was, she was just born, I think. So it's probably been four years. Um, I carry so much of what you've said today with me that I didn't even realize it was from you. And I apologize for that because, but it just, I think it just speaks volumes to how, um, how great the content is. So thank you for being here. Um, we, as Paul said, we can stay on for a few minutes. If you guys have questions, please feel free to take yourself off of mute and ask those.